This week on Myths and Legends, it's our wrap-up to the prequel of the Trojan War, where you'll see how the world's first beauty pageant led to the deaths of tens of thousands, and how you should definitely not help that small, hurt animal, because that's apparently Zeus's favorite way of meeting romantic partners. If you hear vomiting from the woods, it's just the creature of the week, eating dinner. This is Myths and Legends, episode 132b, Some Foolish Thing. This is a podcast where I tell stories from mythology and folklore. Some are incredibly popular stories you think you know, but with surprising origins. Others are stories that might be new to you, but are definitely worth a listen. Previously on the podcast, a child was born in the city of Troy, who was, according to a prophecy, going to bring about the destruction of the city of Troy. The child was abandoned on a mountainside, but because that never worked, was picked up by the Trojan king's herdsman, Agelaus, and raised as his own. That baby was named Paris. Leda screamed and pushed. It was time. She felt the first baby arrive, its first cries filling the air. At last, a moment to relax, she thought. But she was wrong. There were more. Much more. The first was a boy, little Castor. The second was another boy, Pollux. The third, a little girl, Clytemnestra. Triplets, Leda thought. That was surprising, but whatever. It was finished. Then, she felt another sharp pain. More? Except, this one was far, far worse than the others. It felt altogether different. The urge to push came again, and the new mom grimaced and cried and pushed some more until... Finally, it was free. This time, it really was finished. Lita breathed, realizing only then that she never heard the last baby cry. She tried to sit up, but she couldn't. She was too weak. Why wasn't her baby crying? The midwife sat stunned. It's, it's because it wasn't a baby, she said, and held up the egg. Sometime last year, she had helped a goose that had been chased by an eagle. She rescued it, taking it in close to her chest. In one of Zeus's more bizarre choices for copulation, he didn't change out of the goose form when he did what Zeus always does. As always, he was and continues to be the absolute worst. I don't know what Leda's thoughts were as the goose had flapped away, but after giving birth to three other children conceived with her husband, Tyndarius, she knew that that goose had not simply been a super strong and smart bird, familiar with the intricacies of the human reproductive system. No, it had been Zeus, and she had laid an egg. Time passed, and the other kids were nearly six months old when, one day, the egg began to crack. Leda and Tyndarius ran to it, as one chubby little hand, then another broke through the shell. Upon seeing that the baby was a human girl, Leda breathed a sigh of relief and scooped the baby up into her arms. She proclaimed to everyone that this was her daughter, and she would be named Helen. <laughs> Are you joking? No, I'm not an idiot. Zeus snorted to Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera. I'm not going to decide which one of you is the most beautiful. One of you is my wife, one is my daughter, kind of, and one is the goddess of beauty. The objectively... Uh, ah, nope, nope, nope. This, this is a trap. I'm finished talking about this. Hera held up her hands, stopping Zeus. After they saw the apple at Thetis' wedding, she explained, that's all they could think about. I mean, who was it meant for? Are you sure it was even meant for one of you three? Zeus offered, realizing immediately that that was the wrong answer. Attempting to backtrack, Zeus said that he was far from an impartial party. He was married to one of the people in question, so he was biased because of just how much he loved his wife. The three women looked at one another with an eye roll. Smooth. Okay, well, if Zeus wasn't going to do it, then who would? Because the question would tear them apart until they had an answer. Again, Zeus threw up his hands. He didn't know. He'd have to find an impartial third party. 
Sitting back, breathing a sigh of relief after dodging that thunderbolt, Zeus mused aloud. I'm sure we can find someone willing to risk angering two out of three of the most powerful women in the world, one of which is known for her hunting abilities and the other for her legendary vindictiveness. How hard could it be? Paris, now in his teens, had been watching bullfights for months. And that? That was no bull. All this had started for fun. For the smart and extremely bored young man, these bullfights proved a helpful way to pass the time. He started pitting Agalaeus' bulls against one another, crowning the winner with flowers and the loser with straw. Soon, the surrounding town came to see the bullfights, too. And eventually, Agalaeus' neighbors began to put their own bulls in as well. Then, one day, a new bull showed up completely unaccompanied by an owner, without anyone looking after it whatsoever. Patiently, it waited with the others for its turn, and when it stepped into the ring, he proceeded to absolutely dominate the competition. Paris looked at the crowds watching the bulls fight. Were they seeing this? They nodded. Yeah, they saw it. Paris shouldn't be stupid about this. Paris walked out to the massive, victorious bull, singing its praises while resting a crown of gold on its head. It was the winner. The bull, who, yes, wasn't actually a bull, but was actually Ares, the god of war, thinking he'd disguised himself well enough to fool these stupid, stupid humans, smiled. Not only was he the best bull, but they had found their guy. The Olympians had found a smart, competent judge. It was a few weeks later when, herding his cattle on the peak of Mount Ida, Paris heard the buzzing of winged sandals as they lifted their rider over a nearby boulder until he was looking down at Paris. Hey, Paris is it? Hermes called. Paris nodded. Hermes was it? Hermes looked back. How? Oh, the sandals. And the hat. Oh yeah, yeah. Paris was the smart one. He cleared his throat and announced that Paris, being as handsome as he was wise, had been called by Zeus to judge which of these three goddesses was the fairest. Hermes tossed Paris an apple, a golden one which read, to the fairest. And, in a flash, the three goddesses appeared behind Hermes. Aphrodite, Athena, and Hera. Paris chuckled, oh, 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 wow. Yeah, this is definitely a trap. Um, I'm gonna King Solomon it here and just divide the apple. They're all beautiful, done and done. Hermes flew to his side, stopping his hand just as the knife appeared. That wasn't how this worked. Paris could not disobey almighty Zeus. Paris narrowed his eyes and glanced at the goddesses. Even if Zeus was just trying to pawn off his judgment on a hapless mortal, he had some problems with that. Hermes leaned in closer. Paris should really just accept it. You never knew who was watching, he said, looking at the sky. And seriously, when it came to problems with Zeus, take a number, buddy. Paris glanced at the storm cloud gathering in the distance and nodded. He turned to the goddesses, explaining that he was just a stupid, stupid mortal who made, apparently, poor enough decisions to be in this particular scenario. He begged them, no matter how this turned out, to please not bear him any ill will over his decision. He turned to Hermes. Would it be enough for him to judge them as they were? Or should they, you know, be naked? Hermes stepped back, palms out. Hey man, he wasn't allowed to give any advice on how this should go down. It was completely up to Paris. If he was smart enough to judge, he was smart enough to make the rules. Paris shrugged. All right then, they should disrobe. Surprised, Hermes turned around so as to avoid looking at any of the women. Gutsy move for Paris. Athena looked at Aphrodite. No, 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 no. That magic girdle had to go. Aphrodite could use it to make Paris fall in love with her. Aphrodite rolled her eyes and started to undo her girdle. Fine. If she had to take that off, then Athena had to take off her helmet. She looked hideous without it. Paris said that, to avoid distraction, he would judge each goddess in private. He held out his hand. Would Hera be kind enough to come with him? Hera looked down at the outstretched hand and walked past him, off to a different part of the mountain. Well out of earshot of the goddesses or Hermes, Hera spun around slowly. As she did, she asked for Paris to examine her conscientiously, carefully, and remember, 
if he judged her the fairest, she would make him the king of Asia and the richest man in the world. Paris dared to meet the eyes of the goddess, and he would not be bribed, he told Hera. Displaying an awful lot of commitment to this thing he was trying to get out of not a half an hour ago. Hera smirked as she put her clothes back on. They would see about that. Athena was next, and as soon as they were out of earshot, she, too, had an interesting proposition. If she were to win the apple, she would be grateful. So grateful that Paris would be victorious in every battle, as well as the handsomest and wisest man in all the world. Paris sat back and sighed. Well, first, he was a shepherd, so he had never been in a battle. Second, he thought he was pretty good looking already, and by virtue of judging this competition, the gods must have thought him wise, so... Yeah, no. Still, he would consider Athena's claim to the apple fairly. Athena donned her helmet and returned to the others, while Aphrodite made her way to the judging table. Now, Aphrodite has a girdle that can make basically anyone fall in love with her, but she doesn't really need said belt. Especially when talking to some male human herdsman, with mere looks, without even touching him, she had him, and, in moments, Paris was infatuated with Aphrodite. As Aphrodite spun around, she told Paris to look at her body carefully, very carefully, look at every inch of her and miss nothing. She wondered aloud why the handsomest man in the country wasted himself watching cattle. He needed to move to the city while he was young. <gasps> Aphrodite gasped as if she just had an idea, and turned around. Paris was a human, so it could never work between them, but, but, there was another. There was a woman nearly as beautiful as Aphrodite herself. And Paris? Paris could have her. The young man paused, not seeing through the obvious bribe. He stood fixated on Aphrodite, and this woman who was apparently just like her. What's her name? Paris asked. Aphrodite smiled. She had him. The woman's name was Helen. Helen of Sparta. see what Helen's been up to since the last time we left her, but that will be right after this. This week's episode is brought to you by Siren. Have you seen this dark and sexy TV series on Freeform called Siren? It's about a powerful and alluring mermaid, Rin, who mysteriously comes to shore in a small town called Bristol Cove. But she's no little mermaid. First episode, she straight up throws a man through a windshield to defend herself. And now, in this upcoming season, more mermaids have arrived. Is it for refuge? or revenge. What are they looking for? In this show, mermaids are incredible shapeshifters who can avoid detection. When they're on shore, they take human form. However, they're still powerful predators on land or in the sea. I can't wait for the show's return on freeform because it's so unpredictable and so action-packed. You haven't seen this on TV before. You're going to want to check it out. It's a truly unique approach to the mermaid myth. Siren returns on Thursday, January 24th at 8pm on freeform. Don't miss it. This week's episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Zeus didn't need a website. He had Hermes. But say you're not an all-powerful sociopath with an affinity for sandals. What do you do to get your message out there? Squarespace. What's that one thing you've been thinking about doing? We all have something, right? Mine was a podcast, but yours could be a blog, a store, a webcomic, maybe a new business. Well, whatever it is, it needs a website. Squarespace makes it easier than ever to launch your next big thing by letting you customize anything in just a few clicks. Plus, everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box. There's also powerful e-commerce functionality, and their analytics help you grow your site in real time. No patches, no upgrades required, ever. And buying domains is super simple. Having trouble? Use their 24-7 award-winning customer support. And yes, there's an award for that. Anytime we want a fast, nice-looking website that just works, we go with Squarespace. Head on over to squarespace.com myths for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch... Use the offer code MYTHS to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. That's squarespace.com slash MYTHS, offer code MYTHS. All right, now back to the show. As we know, Helen had been kidnapped by Theseus and his friend, and kept with Theseus' mother until she came of age. Her brothers, 
Castor and Pollux, came to rescue her and took her back to Sparta where Tyndareus, the king of Sparta, welcomed her home and, in the same breath, said that she was going to get married because they couldn't have her getting kidnapped again or if she did, it wouldn't be their problem. And so many, many kings came to Sparta to vie for Helen's hand. Menestheus, the king of Athens, was there in addition to the king of Mycenae, Agamemnon, and his brother, Menelaus, two men from the cursed house of Atreus. So was Ajax, son of Telamon, one of the Argonauts and a man who fought beside Hercules. There were many others too, basically every powerful kingdom in Greece and every not so powerful kingdom, like that of Ithaca. The young king of Ithaca came empty handed to Sparta. He wasn't rich, but he was smart. He knew his power couldn't compete with that of Athens, Mycenae and others, but he didn't need it to. He wasn't seeking to marry Helen. That's what grabbed Tyndarius' attention when Odysseus, the king of Ithaca and the grandson of Hermes, bowed low before the Spartan throne, boasting that he came with nothing and he didn't want to marry Helen. When he said that, he had Tyndarius' ear. The Spartan king shot back. Then why had Odysseus come? The clever boy smiled. He felt like he could be helpful to Tyndarius. And in return for that help, maybe Tyndarius could put in a good word for him with the woman he really wanted to marry. Tyndarius laughed. What problem did he have? His daughter was the most desired woman in the Greek world. He had his pick of kings, great warriors, and heroes to join his family. One king, great warrior, or hero would join his family. Odysseus corrected. Then what happens? Would Tyndarius send all the others away, shamed, with nothing? If war didn't break out in under a decade, it would be a miracle. Tyndarius was smart enough not to argue. He nodded to Odysseus. All right, they had a deal. If Odysseus solved this problem, then Tyndarius would make sure he married the woman he wanted. Odysseus smiled and revealed his plan. The next morning, all the kings, great warriors, and heroes were standing on bloody horse bits, reciting the oath that Odysseus had come up with the day before, saying that they would defend the chosen husband against whoever resented his good luck. Since all potential suitors wanted to be the chosen husband, all of them were eager to impress upon their potential father-in-law that they were good sports. And, as we all do when having guests over, Tyndarius slaughtered a horse and asked his suitors to stand on the bloody pieces to sanctify the oath. It's unclear who made the choice, Helen or her father, but Helen emerged soon after, stepping around the horse bits and crowning Menelaus, brother of Agamemnon, as her betrothed. As a way to cement the alliance between Sparta and their powerful neighbor to the north, Clytemnestra was offered in marriage to Agamemnon, and he accepted. The brothers that had once been exiles after a curse had ravaged their family would be kings of two of the most powerful cities in Greece. Everyone grumbled, but the wedding was planned, and, as a credit to the young king of Ithaca's intelligence, no one died. The oath itself was a long-forgotten thing by the end of the feast, and no one thought that it would come back, years later, and drag the whole peninsula to war. In addition, no one knew that Tyndarius, the king they were all honoring, had made a mistake. Years ago, he had been sacrificing to the gods and he had accidentally overlooked Aphrodite. This was, of course, even worse than intentionally omitting her. She hadn't even been important enough for him to remember. And she wasn't, honestly. He was already married and he already had five children. These days, he didn't think much about Aphrodite in her domain, but he should have because while he might have been beyond the reach of the goddess, his children were not. On that day, while the sacrifices to the other Olympians burned, Aphrodite swore that all of Tyndarius's daughters would be notorious for their adulteries. And, on the mountain with Paris, she was using that oath to win a contest. Aphrodite smiled. She could see she had the young herdsman. So she continued, Helen was the beautiful queen of Sparta, after the death of her father. She looked like Aphrodite, was the daughter of Zeus, loved hunting and wrestling, and she had not only been kidnapped by King Theseus, but the whole Greek world had come out as suitors for her wedding. Paris furrowed his brow. Suitors? So... So what? Aphrodite said. She was married to Menelaus of the house of Atreus. Big deal. Aphrodite was the one who arranged things like love and marriage. 
she wasn't saying she wanted to win the contest, but if she did, maybe there would be an opportunity for Paris to tour the Greek world, and maybe Aphrodite's son, Eros, aka Cupid, would travel along with him. Paris looked at her. He appreciated subtlety, but there was kind of a lot riding on this contest. She was bribing him. He was into it. That was cool. Uh, but he really needed an oath. Aphrodite immediately swore, and Paris said she could put the girdle back on. The judging was finished. Paris broke his vow that he wouldn't be bought, and as he handed Aphrodite the apple that read, to the fairest, across the side, Athena and Hera broke their vows, not to bear the judge ill will. This, however, presented a problem. What could they do to him that life hadn't already? He had no one, save a father who was almost as poor as he was. It wasn't like he was some prince in a city. They'd have to get creative. The pair of goddesses shrugged. They had time. He was just some herdsman. It wasn't like he was going anywhere. But Paris was going somewhere. He was going to Troy. He was out tending the bulls a few weeks later, when the messenger came. It was time for the ceremony. Ceremony? The servant rolled his eyes. He was just a servant, and he'd just run all the way here for the bulls. He didn't have time for exposition. But whatever, you make this quick. Years ago, the royal seer decreed that any child born on such and such date had to be killed. But who had become a father on that day? King Priam. Respecting the gods, the child was killed. And... Each year, there were bullfights in the baby's honor. Because nothing honors babies like bullfights. Paris thought about it. Huh. That was weird. Such and such date was his birthday. Why didn't his dad ever tell him about the games? Well, he had gotten super into bullfighting in the past year. So who was going to go this time? He offered up the champion bull that wasn't secretly a Greek god in disguise and found his father. Agalaeus wrung his hands. He wondered if this day would come. Paris was the son of a king, and Agelaus always thought that he was never meant to live and die out here. He resolved to go with the boy, to keep him safe. As the men with swords surrounded Paris in the arena, Agelaus could see that he had failed pretty hard. It was one thing to go to Troy to watch bullfights. It was another to enter a boxing match and win and enter the foot race, and win, and enter the wrestling match, and win. Priam's eldest son, a man by the name of Hector, took the losses the hardest. He arranged for an armed guard at every exit, and a sword in he and his brother's hands. This little herdsman, this nobody that shamed the sons of Priam before an entire kingdom, would be cut down. Exhausted after beating them so handily in everything, Priam didn't see the swords, till they almost ran him through he ducked back into the arena and the crowd saw a circle of bronze close in on the unfortunate champion. They were yelling so loudly that Agalaeus' screams couldn't reach the ears of Priam. As he watched the swords closing in on the baby he had saved, the closest thing to a son he would ever have, he knew he couldn't let Paris die this way. He jumped into the arena, pushed aside the guards and put himself between Paris and the swords. King Priam looked down, squinting. He recognized that man. He he hadn't seen him since. He commanded his sons and their guards to stop and hear the herdsmen out. Agalaeus approached the king and dug into his bag. He said he wasn't sure if he would need this, but today he was glad he had it. He held out a rattle. It was the same one Paris had been holding when the king gave the command. Agalaeus hadn't been able to see it through, though. This kid, the one that bested all his other sons, this was his boy. Priam and Hecuba took each other's hands and stood. Paris had been their last. It had been too painful, the thought of having another. Now, he was alive. And look, Troy was safe. It would be okay. Priam yelled out for his sons to sheathe their weapons, but they already had. They were walking to the young man who, even though he was years younger, was almost as tall as all of them. If he was one of them, then of course he could beat them. They cheered their new brother. Paris couldn't quite believe it. It felt like a dream as the funeral games turned into a celebration. His father, his foster father, he corrected, disappeared into the crowd as the royal family came to embrace him. 
Priam took his son into his arms, and then he heard a familiar voice. It was Asakus, the priest of Apollo that had thrown down the order to kill the infants on the day of Paris' birth. This was it, he said. This was the one all the sides had warned about. This was the baby that would doom their country. Paris had to be put to death. Priam stepped in between his sons, saying that he had made a mistake all those years ago. His son was alive, and he wouldn't lose his boy again, even if Troy burned for it. Six months later, Paris could see his father was agitated. Long ago, when Priam was just a boy, the city of Troy had been breached by some heroes from Greece. Two, one by the name of Hercules, and the other Telamon, had killed Priam's father, making him the king when he was little more than a boy. The intruders had also taken his sister. Priam's kingship had been bought by the last words from his sister. She would go willingly with the man who murdered their father if Priam was allowed to stay. Hercules laughed, wondering what trouble a boy king could make for the Greeks, and agreed. Now, Priam owed his sister, Hesione, everything, and he never stopped trying to get her back. He sent envoys out to the Greeks, but they were either chased away or met with laughter. It had been decades, but he had never stopped trying. The latest news was that two of his sons were returning empty-handed. Priam wasn't even sure if she was alive anymore. Paris put his hands on his father's. He would go. This year, he had done the impossible already, going from herdsman to prince. Now, he would bring his aunt home. Hector, the eldest son of Priam, would remember what Paris said next to his dying day. Paris turned and, with a smile, said that if he couldn't get Hesione back, maybe he'd carry off another Greek princess as ransom. A wariness grew in Hector. Somewhere, deep down in his marrow, he felt something he hadn't in a long time. Fear. For some reason, he felt that maybe his brother Asakus had been right. Maybe they should have listened. It took nearly a year, but the ships were prepared and built exactly to Paris's specifications with a carved image of Aphrodite in the front of each, holding her son, Eros, aka Cupid. Toward the end of construction, an unexpected visitor arrived, a guy by the name of Menelaus, the king of Sparta, after the death of his father-in-law. He had come to the region to offer sacrifices at a certain altar to ease a plague that was now ravaging Sparta, and Paris was quick to entertain him at Troy. At the end of the week, Menelaus offered his sacrifices and departed but he and Paris had gotten on so well together that Paris begged Menelaus to receive him if he ever made it as far as Sparta. Menelaus smiled. Paris was a young guy, probably the age of Menelaus's wife, but yeah, they did get on well. Sure, he laughed. If Paris came to Sparta, Menelaus would show him how to throw a real party. Months later, when the crews were chosen and it was time to set out, Priam, the king of Troy, looked on the ships. His daughter, Cassandra, would not shut up about the trip. It was all, I have a bad feeling about this, and this will kill us all. She was always going on about this or that. She thought she was a prophet, but all she ever talked about was how things would go wrong. Maybe Priam would ship her off to some king. Someone far, far away, so he wouldn't have to listen to her nonsense. King Priam watched Paris sail from the harbor. For once, he felt hopeful about the future. He had his son back, and if his son's confidence was to be believed, he would soon have his sister back as well. Paris seemed to have a way with the Greeks, too. He'd gotten along so well with that Spartan king a few months back. Priam smiled. He had a good feeling about this trip. Months later, after Paris finally made his way to Sparta, he sat at a banquet. It was the night he had been waiting for since he was a herdsman on that mountain, judging the goddesses. Ever since he had heard her name, he knew that she was the one he was supposed to be with. Even if it cost him his kingdom, as soon as he saw her, he knew she was worth it. Helen, queen of Sparta, watched the stranger from half a world away. She watched him 
watching her. She was used to attention. She had been kidnapped by a king when she was just nine, after all. But this was different. This was a way that her husband, Menelaus, even though he had won her hand over countless other kings, had never looked at her before. This was love. Odysseus heard Penelope yelling for him. Penelope was the whole reason he had gone to join the suitors of Helen of Sparta. Penelope's father was a Spartan prince, and, after Odysseus beat him in a foot race, they were allowed to marry. Together, they left for a quiet life on Ithaca, Odysseus's island kingdom, and together, they had a son, a boy by the name of Telemachus. It was a peaceful life, a quiet life, that is, until the ships came. Penelope stood yelling for him, because the king of Mycenae was at the gate. Agamemnon was there. Something had happened, so he was calling on Odysseus to fulfill his oath, the very oath that Odysseus had crafted. Some kid by the name of Paris had stolen Helen of Sparta, and they were going to go bring her back. So, here we are. The Trojan War is finally upon us. We didn't show the actual event of the abduction of Helen, because there's some debate as to whether or not she went willingly. Some sources made it seem like they fell in love, and she absconded, while others say that Paris just took her and ran after Menelaus left for Crete. Of course, Hera and Athena, still bitter after losing the Golden Apple beauty contest to Aphrodite, really didn't appreciate watching the contest judge build an entire fleet of ships with Aphrodite's image plastered on each one. This Paris guy was proving to be less of a random nobody herdsman and more of an important prince, a prince on whom the fate of an entire kingdom rested. And therefore, he had a lot more to lose than they initially thought. So, when he left with Helen, Hera commanded Iris, the messenger of the gods, to deliver a message to Menelaus on Crete instantly. The next day, Menelaus left Crete, sailing to Agamemnon, his own brother, demanding that war be made. Agamemnon considered the message and agreed if Envoy sent to Troy came back empty-handed because everything had been discovered weeks earlier than it should have been. Thanks to Hera, those envoys beat the cautious Paris back to Troy and they, indeed, came back empty-handed because Priam, the king of Troy, had no idea what they were talking about and shot back questions about his sister. The messengers noted Priam's hostility and motive and they returned to Agamemnon without success and all the kings of Greece were called with a reminder of their prior oaths. The Trojan War is fascinating, because it seems like it's a war that no one really wanted, but everyone was dragged into. Robert Graves muses that Paris probably didn't think there would be any consequences to his actions. No war happened when the Argonauts abducted Medea, when Ariadne left with Theseus, or even when Hercules took Paris' own aunt. Odysseus couldn't have imagined that, with his oath, the one he used to smooth things over with the suitors and secure his own marriage, will be used to draw the entire Greek world into battle. In fact, when Agamemnon came knocking, Odysseus proved the most difficult to convince. And, in terms of the goddesses, maybe Aphrodite knew what she was doing, but she seemed to just offer up Helen to win the contest. And Hera and Athena's problem was with Paris, at first, and not with Troy itself. So, I don't think anyone wanted this war. But a conspiracy of circumstances came together to rope everyone into it, and dominate the Greek world the next 10 years. But that won't be for a little while. Next week, we're getting into a really bizarre and awesome story from Filipino folklore, so you'll really want to check that one out. I want to say thanks to Happy Donkey Donut Lady, Save Verse DM, Nina2813, JDL121212, Chick P. Romero, Behole Ninja, Rachel Udi, Spread and Joy, Nerdy Nix, Insert Witty Nickname Here, Bacon John, J Maw42, Malthus, Stunning Tripod, and Sigrid Sigrid for the reviews on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening and reviewing the show. And if you'd like to leave a review, Apple Podcasts is still the best place. You can find the show there at apple.mythpodcast.com. And there's still a membership thing on the site. For less than the price of a pint-sized 
ice cream lock. I'll put a link to it. It's a lock that goes on the top of a pint-sized ice cream container, and I guess keeps people out of it. You can get extra episodes, source pack ebooks, and ad-free versions of the show that don't cost seven times the price of a pint of ice cream, and aren't rendered completely useless by someone just cutting open the bottom. Check out support.mythpodcast.com for more info on the membership. The creature this week is the Lucrocata, from Greek folklore. If you're ever hanging around 2nd century Greek cowards, as we all do from time to time on the weekends, and hear someone off vomiting after a long night, that's the Lucrocata. It's gearing up for, let's call it an appetizer, before the main course. Unfortunately, you are the main course. And the dog that just couldn't keep itself from that delicious sounding human vomit? They're the appetizer. The Lucrocata is like a hyena, but a hyena that's as brave as a lion as swift as a horse, and as strong as a bull. Also, it can't be beaten by weapons or steel, in case you were worried it wasn't scary enough. For humans, it gets slightly more clever than making vomit sounds off in the dark forest. It doesn't just mimic human regurgitation, but human speech as well. It'll wait among the thickets while people work, and do more than I've done at any get-together ever, and learn everyone's name. After people break up to herd cattle or collect wood, the lucrocata will mimic your friend's voice, and say something mundane like, Hey buddy! You want to come look at something real quick? When it's legged you far enough away, it'll reveal that it wasn't just Bill showing you a weird-looking frog, but a creature with a lion's tail, neck, and chest, the head of a badger, and what's quite possibly the creepiest slash dorkiest part about it, a wide, joker smile that literally goes from ear to ear. That would be unnerving if the Lucrocata had teeth, because it doesn't have teeth, it has tooth. One long, curved, sharp bone on the top and bottom instead of individual teeth. You probably won't wonder this before it eats you, but Pliny the Elder did and answered the pressing question of how the two ridges of bones aren't blunted by contact with one another. And he came up with an obvious solution. The monster wears a retainer. After it finishes eating you, it just pops its retainer back in, either one that's built into the mouth or one that it somehow carries around and just delicately takes out any time it wants to devour a human whole. That's it for this week. Myths and Legends is by Jason and Carissa Weiser. Our theme song is by the band Broke for Free, and the Creature of the Week music is by Steve Colmes. There are links to even more music in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.